welcome back to Food and Forest. And today we're going to give you a little tour of our young food forest. The size of our food forest is about 20 by 30 metres. And we planted the majority of the main trees and shrubs into this area between January and March of 2019. So let's go and check it out. So first of all, you might be wondering, what is a food forest? And basically what it is, is it's replicating the closed loop system of a normal forest that you would find. Although the main elements of it, um, which are the plants, the shrubs and the trees, all have an edible or maybe a medicinal or some other use, like um, for example, using flax as twine. In essence, what I mean by a closed loop system is a full sun area like this was when we first cleared it is very difficult to maintain because everything is trying to grow at a million miles an hour, annual and perennial weeds, for example, whereas a forest or ancient woodland is very stable and it looks after itself. Food forests or forest gardens, as they're sometimes called as well, are often described as being labelled as having layers and a system of layers. And the first one of those is the tree or the canopy layer. Like our fruit trees, which are mostly grafted onto vigorous rootstocks. And although these have the potential to grow into large trees, they'll just reach the height you want a bit quicker than something like a dwarf rootstock, for example. This will allow them to get quite large, but we can prune them so the canopies aren't quite touching so light will still reach the floor to our berry bushes underneath. The next layer is your shrub layer and we use lots of fruit and berry bushes for this, just like this blackcurrant bush. Then there's a ground cover layer. We use lots of strawberries and low growing edible or beneficial flowers for this layer. We've also got an underground layer to our food forest where we have tubers and some roots. We've got things like ochre, potatoes and horseradish and yakon planted in the food forest as well. Another layer that food forest systems often have is the climbing or vertical layer, which would be things like grapevines or in the case of this apricot tree, in the future, I plan to have passion fruits climbing up here. So in this area, which is the more southerly end of the food forest that gets the most sun and is the most open, uh, we have some of our cane type fruits. And here we've got various varieties of raspberries. One of our favourite is the Autumn Bliss, which is a beautiful yellow variety, stunning. Um, and we've got also got logan berries, tay berries on the ground here. And in this area along here, we keep it as a nice open strip uh, so we can have some annual and perennial full sun loving plants like these golden zucchinis down here or yellow squashes. Also, we've got some Cape gooseberries here are dotted seven or eight in this area the other day. Uh, we've got ochres down here, potatoes, planted a couple of North American pawpaw trees here recently as well. I'm also utilising this area a bit as a bit of a nursery area here where I'm growing on. I like to grow a couple of hundred cordial lines each year from seed. Um, got some more various fruit trees that will be going in over time. And if you'd like to follow me down this way, some more raspberries. They've gone pretty out of control. As you can see here, they've completely covered around the base of this apricot tree. So we shall have to have a little clear out at the end of the year of those. Also some cultivated blackberries here. Um, this is a fawnless variety. I believe it was called Loch Ness and they don't seem to suit themselves so well like the raspberries do with an upright habit. So it may be that we move these somewhere along the line to more of a wild area around the land somewhere. 
Over here we have an Asian pear, which I did as a graft actually from one of our neighbour's trees. And it's coming on well, but it has been a bit smothered by this Achillea or yarrow here, which is another plant, absolutely stunning. We introduced it, hoping it might stay as kind of a small clump, but it's starting to take over and from seed. So this is another one that we'll probably move elsewhere in the future. Along this strip, we have kind of a straight pathway leading up into our main beds up here. And we've lined this with more perennial, just beautiful plants really, and flowers along the left-hand side here. Um, we've got plants like Echinacea, this is the purple variety, stunning, Leucoramphiums, and all manner of other things along here. Uh, what are these called, Laurie? Can you remember the name? Centura Mondara. Centura Mondara, apparently. It's very nice. And lots of strawberries. And some more strawberries along there. And we have something here that grows a bit wild and mad, um, which are the goji berries. As of yet, in all honesty, they haven't done a great deal. We've got two or three of them. And they seem to just put these long arms out and they just spread around and they'll root again, but they haven't done a massive deal in the way of flowering yet. So maybe if you're experienced with them and you have good success and there's a special way of pruning them, maybe you could let us know in the comments down below. But moving on down here, this is a tree I'm very excited about actually. And this is called a cherry plum and it's native to Europe and love these because me and my dad used to go out and there were some wild ones um, along the shoreline we used to go up and we'd collect bags full of these and these were actually seedling trees grown from seed and this year i don't know if you can see here they're starting to get their first little fruits and they often come the wild varieties anyway they could be yellow or red fruits and I grew two, and fortunately we have a yellow and a red. So very excited about these. Very easy to care for as well, but they do have a very wild habit. They'll send out kind of one meter, two meter long branches in every direction uh, very quickly. So you have to keep on top of them. Nice cherry tree here. I believe this was a van. Um, this one was one that we replaced because the original one died, unfortunately. Uh, but it's coming on well now and hopefully next year we'll get our first little bit of fruit in action going on from it. And meandering our way through here, we've got more of the ground covers starting to take hold now. The marigolds and the strawberries are putting out loads of runners this year and they are a variety called Albion, which are supposed to be ever-bearing, which means you'll get one crop, maybe early summer, and then on a good year, you might get a second one later on. We've yet to have a second one, but who knows? This tree here, another very exciting one. And this is called a family fruit tree. And family fruit trees are basically trees that have multiple varieties grafted on them. And this is a pear, and it's the first year, if I can find some here for you, that we start to have some fruits on here. And one of the beauties about having a family tree is that often varieties that will pollinate each other are grafted together. So you might often have to have two or three trees to achieve good pollination. If you have a family tree, you can have all your pollination done on one tree. They're right next to each other, which means there's more chance of the bee or whatever insect flying around on the same tree. So very good, very excited about that. And I think we've got a dessert variety on there and two others. I'll put the two varieties on the screen for you. Um, more goji berries here. And we've got a few dotted in squash plants in here this year. They're not doing too well, but they did do very well last year. So I think it was more just a bit of transplant shock. They were in the pots for a bit too long. Down here, we have some beautiful blueberries just starting to get ripe. 
and this whole band across here is multiple varieties of blueberries. The problem we have found with blueberries is every single one, the second they get near to ripeness, gets stripped by birds. So unfortunately, we're thinking we may have to remove the blueberries from in here and have them in a separate netted house, which is a real shame, but we'll see how they go this year. But if we get left with nothing, then unfortunately, we may as well have something a bit more productive there. Coming over here, it looks a bit of a mess down here, but this is comfrey. And these are great to have at the bases or around um, trees or fruit trees in particular, like this, and because they are a mineral accumulator and their roots go very deep down into the soil and they can bring up minerals which low rooted trees and other plants may not normally have access to and it makes them available to them. And also, you've probably heard already that you can either chop or drop the foliage around your trees as a great feed, or you can collect this up and put it in a barrel and let it rot down to make a really good liquid feed, but it does stink. We've got some going at the moment and it's pretty rancid. The plants do love it though. And down here in this band, we have tons and tons of gooseberry bushes. And they actually, we do have quite good success with those we found. Although the birds do strip them again, just as they become ripe. But we do have just enough left for us that it still kind of makes it viable. And the very best variety that we found that we like the best are the red ones, which are called Hinamaki Red. Okay, what have we got here? So this one is another of our wild cherry plum trees. And this is the yellow variety. And there's a couple here that are just starting to become ripe. And as this matures, they are actually smothered in them, absolutely covered, which is very exciting. And there's a cultivated version of these called Mirabelles, um, which might be more of the common name you might have heard of these. And they're a very nice cross between like a cherry and a plum, which is why they're called cherry plums. Um, more like a small plum though, really, but absolutely delicious. And you can just eat tons of them. One thing that has been really successful in the food forest for us so far, considering the age of everything, are these blackcurrant bushes. For two seasons now, we have had really, really good crops of blackcurrants. So much so that we've been making blackcurrant cordial. And you may have seen our recent video on that and seen the big tubs of blackcurrants that we've been collecting already. So here we have one of our apple trees. And at present, we've got four and I made sure that we got varieties that will all cross pollinate with each other to ensure we have good pollination. Um, it's one of those years this year where you have kind of on and off years and they don't have very many fruits on this year, unfortunately, but hopefully next year we'll have a good abundant crop. And we did struggle a bit with the weather conditions this season. In spring, we had a lot of frosts and then a lot of heavy winds um, and heavy rain storms as well, which probably did affect the flowers that were forming. Now down here, something that we get on most well with actually are blackcurrant bushes. And we must have probably about nine, 10, maybe more um, of all different varieties of blackcurrants. We also have white currants and red currants. Although me and Laurie have found we do love the black currants the most. <laughs> Something interesting that um, I've personally found is that with the black currants, there's actually quite a lot of difference in taste between the different varieties. And I at first wanted to go out and get every single type of variety I could, but I found um, a lot of them to be very quite bitter and astringent for me, and they make my teeth really sensitive. Um, and there's one variety called Ben Serek that I found to be my favorite, actually. Coming through here, we have uh, some fig trees. These are the most commonly sold variety in the UK and probably because they're one of the most 
uh, reliable as well, which are called brown turkey. Um, we do get quite hard frost here, and unfortunately the last couple of years, all of the baby figs that are forming have been damaged and fallen off over winter. So maybe as the other trees around establish, we'll have a bit of frost protection. Um, if not, we can look to moving them somewhere else. Next door here, we've got some white currants and Laurie doesn't like these whatsoever. It's the first year they've produced fruit for us and I must admit they are very bitter and not very nice at all. So that, and seedy, yeah. So they will probably be something that we do move out in time and replace with something we prefer a bit more. Looking here, we've got an absolutely ridiculous sized gooseberry bush. This one has gone absolutely mad. I'm not sure what variety it is, but it hasn't really got any fruits on this year. So this one, for example, we may remove, but I do have some more baby Hinamaki reds that we can replace it with. Because after all, I think it's about planting not only massive variety, uh, but you have to like what you're planting. And there's quite a few things that just haven't been very nice. So whilst diversity is very important, you also have to blend that with actually liking what you're planting. So that's something we've learned. The comfrey has pretty much finished flowering now, but I do just love having this in the food forest. And as soon as I've got time, I will take some transplants or some cut-ins um, and put it around the base of all the other fruit trees because it's so good for bringing the nutrients up from, the, from deep in the soil. The bees love it and also it makes amazing feed for your plants even though it is amazingly stinky as well. And over here, this tree is my quince tree and it's had a little bit of a hard start this quince tree but for some reason I've just always wanted to have a quince tree. Um, years ago when I was first getting into gardening I remember reading in a gardening magazine about quinces and I just I just had to have a quince tree. Um, this tree was actually planted at my home originally it was only a year or two year old tree when I bought it bare root and yeah, I planted it at home, but then obviously we started um, establishing the food forest. And so it's been dug up and bought here. And it also has had a little bit of a hard job getting its roots in the ground. We had to have it tied up for a couple of years or a year, but it seems to be just hanging in there. So fingers crossed, um, it will really get its roots down deep now. And if you haven't used quince before, you can't eat them, um, you can't eat quince raw, you have to cook them. And when you cook them up, they have the most beautiful fragrant smell and flavour. And I think that's one of the things that's always really appealed to me about them. So we have got a whole load of raspberries in this food forest, too many really. And that is just, again, due to a little bit of neglect. Um, but we're not too worried about it. It's all salvageable and we will get everything back in order um, just as soon as we can. But we have, yeah, we have mostly autumn raspberries, um, some red and some yellow, but the yellows are definitely our favourites. In the winter, I spent quite a lot of time transplanting strawberry runners from our overgrown strawberry bed in our main growing area and planting them anywhere I could into the food forest. And as you can see here, these ones are starting to establish quite well. And what our long term goal is to literally have strawberries all over the floor in here and create a fully edible ground cover which will help to smother out a lot of the weeds um, particularly the sorrel which is something that we struggle with here. In this section here our ground cover layer of strawberries is getting really well established and doing a really good job. We've got two different types of strawberries in this area we've got the alpine strawberries and then we've got your more conventional strawberries. Another plant we have in our ground cover layer is this interesting plant called coltsfoot. 
and I found a bit of this at the roadside once and planted it a couple of years ago. And I've had to control it a bit, but it's a very interesting plant. In the spring, before any of the foliage shows, you get these beautiful dandelion-like flowers that emerge and the leaves actually come after that, uh, which is quite a spectacle actually. And it also has an important medical use for lung ailments as well. We're also using a mixture of calendula varieties. And of course you have um, the very famous and well-used pot marigold, the standard little orange one. But we also have a couple of uh, cultivated varieties with much more frilly petals in varying colours as well. And these spread quite prolifically as an annual from seed. So they're almost like a perennial plant because they are just so successful at spreading and covering the ground. And of course, you can also add the petals to a nice salad. And one of my favourites is this variety here called Candyman Orange. Something that's really surprised me this year is the amount of gooseberries and currants that have self-seeded and grown everywhere. We've got herbs dotted around the food forest as well. We've got three different types of mint, including this apple mint here, and then we've got a spearmint over there, and a chocolate mint over the other side, which is really spreading out nicely. We also have lots of um, flowers, which are beneficial for insects and bees, just like this mandara. And then down here, I've got some horseradish, which creates one of the underground layers. And I use the horseradish in the fire cider, which I make for a winter tonic. We have lots of beautiful flowers in the food forest too, because they will bring in the bees and the beneficial insects, just like this beautiful Rebecca here. This plum tree is an example of something that hasn't gone too well. And actually it was really healthy and vigorous until I pruned it at, I think it was over winter this year. And after that, it started off okay in spring, but it's now covered in thousands of boreholes from some kind of insect. So if that's something you know about, please let us know in the comments below. Uh, obviously gonna have to replace this. Uh, so I'll have to do more research on could me pruning it be the cause of this invasion or maybe that's just something that's happened anyway. Other plants and shrubs we have here include rhubarb, June berries, Chinese blackberries. We have three or four New Zealand flax plants which are great for using anywhere you would normally use string and also in the future I would love to get into flax weaving as well. This is honeyberry, but it hasn't yet set any fruit for us. This is a persimmon tree called Nikita's Gift. It remains to be seen whether it's going to manage to set fruit here yet, but I've got my fingers crossed. This is a Chinese date tree, and we're definitely pushing the limits with this one. Although it's hardy enough to withstand our winter temperatures, whether it gets hot enough summer temperatures to successfully fruit and flower remains to be seen. We have two varieties of these, one called Lang and one called Li as pollination partners, and they are both flowering this year, so we'll see what happens. We also have plenty of herbs, including this one, even in primrose, and several different varieties of mint. Even though our fruit trees are still young, even when they're at their mature stage, they still won't resemble what most people think of as a forest. That's because the vast majority of fruiting trees and shrubs in temperate regions require a full sun position to partial shade. If the trees were left to get too large and the canopy closes, like in the native forest, all of the fruit would be at the top of the trees and very difficult to harvest, and not enough light would penetrate to the floor for the other berry and currant bushes to thrive. Some of the challenges that we've um, come up against so far in our food forest 
have been things like the constant battle with sorrel and bramble that we have here. We, when we cleared this area, we did put down a really, really deep layer of wood chip to um, obviously help counteract regrowth of weeds. But bramble is pretty ferocious stuff and it does still keep coming through. And what we've found is when we've tried to dig the roots out, that's unfortunately triggered more weeds to come back through because we're disturbing the soil instead of leaving the nice layer of wood chip in place. So yeah, that's one of the that's one of the, the battles that we have here. But again, as the trees establish and we get a proper canopy set up here, that should hopefully be alleviated a little bit more as well. We also ended up with a rabbit getting stuck in here despite this area being rabbit fenced somehow i think we had a, a weak spot in the fence and a rabbit got in here and um, made a nest as well and all the strawberries that i had transplanted in the winter which were actually covered in fruit even though they were only the first year had all of their fruit stripped off by the rabbit. Um, he ate the tops off all the chives and a few various other things that he decided he liked the taste of, or she. Um, yeah, so that was, that, was a, that was a bit of a challenge to, um, to get the rabbits out, which we think we've done now. And the other thing that was probably a little bit of a setback in starting the food forest was quite a few of the trees that we um, that we bought bare root or in pots, uh, particularly some of the trees that were pushing the boundaries a little bit more, we, we did lose um, quite a few trees. Um, so yeah, so that's been another challenge. But you know, the whole thing is just learning about the fruits and the foods that we like and what works here and that we actually want to grow. And as we've discussed already, as we've gone round showing you what we have, we are learning um, all the time about what may stay and what may go and then the kind of things that we'll replace it with. So it's just this constant um, evolution of like what's happening in our food forest at this young stage. We hope you've enjoyed taking a look around our young food forest here on the south coast of England today. And if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to press the like button for us and to subscribe if you haven't already. And thanks again for watching and we hope you enjoyed it. Peace, Peace and, and plants. plants.